B-O-U-R-G-I-N, uh, who also was a reporter, didn't attend the first trial, but attended the subsequent trial. But, so they have uh, come through, and a third person named Alan Dreyfus. Uh, I caught up with him in Michigan. Uh, Matt, could you focus your remarks a little bit? You don't have a mic, and they can't hear you right now. Okay. Well, can they hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. do, do you, yeah, okay. You could turn around more. Yeah, if you could turn, can you turn yourself a little? Turn your chair a little? So well, let's rearrange. Let me set the scene, I suppose, for all of us. Uh, Linda Holmes was part of uh, a couple of documentaries which appeared on uh, the History Channel yeah. and also one with Oliver North, and I think it's that one which tied in you with a gentleman who was here last September named Bob Donahue. Bob Donahue, right. Because I would not have known anybody was alive of uh, who actually covered the prosecution of the Japanese war uh, criminals, uh, but Bob was. Bob was there at the main trial and subsequently came here and spent a week here. A whole week, that's right. He was here. For and I don't know if you know, but he subsequently has passed away. Yeah, I, I didn't know that he had died about six months ago. Right. Roly told me that, yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, because of you, uh, your book mentions Bob Donahue, that uh, Bob was uniquely uh, an individual where he did the Japanese war crimes trial, then went over to Nuremberg for the subsequent trial with Telford Taylor. He was dismissed from Telford Taylor's employment. And the final piece of his pu puzzle over Europe, he was then assigned to represent Balder von Schirach's second in command at a trial in Dachau. He was so upset by being dismissed that he defended this guy with zeal actually got an affidavit of Rudolf Hess in support of von Schirach, the only guy to ever get an affidavit, and he got an acquittal. So if you can imagine, this guy went from prosecuting the Japanese war crimes trial, Nuremberg, Dachau, got an acquittal of the number two guy in the Nazi youth movement. Uh, Bob had quite a career. He really did, and he was a great help to me. How did you catch up with him? Well, uh, I learned about him from uh, the uh, chief researcher at the National Archives in College Park, and John Taylor knows everybody. He has the world's best Rolodex. And he talked about Donahue, and he said that Donahue knew why it was that the Japanese company CEOs were never brought to trial, they were never indicted, and I contacted him and subsequently visited him with him several times. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me that the Japanese CEOs were detained right at the end of the war, just as all the big German industrialists were detained. Mm -hmm. But unlike Germany, where, as I mentioned uh, earlier up in Fredonia, Patton's tanks rolled all through Germany. They rolled right up to the city halls. They went in, they swept up all the Nazi documents. The Nazis had no time to dispose of anything. So we had a tremendous paper trail for Nuremberg. But the Japanese, uh, the day after the emperor announced on the radio that uh, we had to end the war and that they had to bear the unbearable, uh, an order went out, a secret message went out, and the Japanese did not know that we had broken their diplomatic code. We broke it in 1939, so we were reading their diplomatic messages all through the war. And unlike uh, the German and the British and the American, all their messages were very cryptic. But the Japanese, thinking no one was reading them, they're very long and detailed and very direct. And uh, the message went out, secret message went out on August 16th, 1945, the day after the surrender, uh, destroy or burn all documents which might be embarrassing to us. And so all the important papers that might fall into our hands pretty much were destroyed or more importantly were hidden. And the Japanese just lied and said they had destroyed them or they got burned in our bombings or whatever. So when Donahue arrived with the chief prosecutor, Joseph Keenan, in Tokyo in December 1945, getting ready for the trials, which opened in May 1946, Keenan said, okay, where's 
where are all the documents? And they said, well, we haven't really found many. And um, so we were very hampered that way. And by the fact that they lied and concealed things, we did not have enough of a paper trail, as Donna High said, they didn't have enough paperwork to sustain an indictment. So they released all these CEOs. And the weirdest thing that happened was that throughout the Tokyo war crimes trials and when they got to the class B and C trials that had to do with mistreatment of prisoners of war, not one Japanese company was mentioned, even though all of these prisoners were on company property and working in company factories, company shipyards, company mines, they were all operated by the companies. And uh, not one company is named. And I thought that was rather peculiar. And I asked Donahai about it, and he said, well, there was kind of a little unwritten agreement that if they weren't going to indict the CEOs, they didn't mention the company names. And these men knew they were in camp number five at Osaka, but they didn't know that Nippon Steel ran that camp. They, I sat up till two in the morning so many times helping someone find, someone would write to me and I would help him find what, what company he had worked for. By way of a backdrop, uh you wrote the book Unjust Enrichment, which has been critically acclaimed, and uh, wonderfully so. Uh, and it's the, the preface for those who probably didn't get a chance to read much about the uh, article that appeared in the paper, but during World War II, Allied prisoners of war were used as slave labor by many of Japan's leading in industrial companies, companies that are now household names like Mitsubishi, Kawasaki, Toyota. Allied prisoners were starved, beaten, tortured, while unwilling unwillingly and illegally serving Japan's war efforts. Those who survived returned home changed forever, but their suffering went unrecorded until now. Uh, the, your, your book came out in... 2001. Uh, you know, literally 55 years after the war. We certainly knew about the uh, slave labor in Europe. Yes. That was very much part of the trial, very well known, uh, and they knew about Krupp, they knew about all of those that were potential defendants at the first trial and became defendants at the subsequent trial. Yet, I must tell you, I read this, this was all new to me. And uh, just the fact that there were American prisoners of war used for slave labor. We certainly knew about Bataan, we knew about mm. all those other, uh, which were awful, but kind of more of a concentration camp type arrangement. Um, what led you into this? Well, it was the serendipity, and, and of course, I think the newspaper background, when you discover a story that hasn't been told, and you want to get the facts and get the story out, I consider it my best piece of investigative reporting. But it was an Australian who had been on the Burma Railway, the bridge on the River Kwai, and he had family on Shelter Island, where I have my home, Eastern Long Island, little island off the end of Eastern Long Island. And he would come to visit, and you know the British, when they come to visit, they stay two months. <laughs> and he was an Anglican, so he came to our little Episcopal church. And I got to know him quite well. And he had been an, a newspaper man at one point, too. And we kind of really clicked. We just developed a very nice friendship. And we corresponded for about eight years in between the visits. And after he died, his wife, who was his second wife, was looking in his bureau drawer. And here was a pile of letters that he had written home to his first wife. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the unnecessary cruelties the Japanese did was they wouldn't let the men receive their mail. Even though sacks of mail were delivered to the camps and the men could look through the slats in the commandant's headquarters, sometimes see letters addressed, packages addressed to them that they weren't allowed to have. So when they were liberated, and here he was in Thailand, and the whole countryside was teeming with armed Japanese who had just fled the camps. He sat, and he, a, a little American plane came in every day, brought mail, brought supplies, and took out mail. So he wrote 15 letters home to his wife, and it was the tone of those letters that drew me to want to write about these men because the spirit, the indomitable spirit, the determination to look ahead, 
because if you dwell on the past, you are still a captive in your own mind. And he understood this right from the get-go, and so did his friends. And you know, his letters would be, um, today they found the remains of a POW chained to a tree in the jungle, and whoever was responsible will be found and punished. The next paragraph is, but you would love the costumes in the Kabuki Theater in Bangkok. You know, I mean, it was just incredible, the, the yin-yang with these people. And as I talked to him, and one of the most touching things is always, uh, and Rocky found this out with his brother Tony, they don't almost never talk about mm -hmm. their experience, but every once in a while, something will remind him. We were at Boy Scout Sunday in our church, and our, our priest had been an Eagle Scout, so he always had the scouts taking part and taking part in the, at the altar, collecting the plates and whatnot. And at coffee, Cecil said to me, you know, seeing all those scouts reminded me of an incident on the railway. And ooh, up went the attendant, because he never hardly talked about anything. And he said, we noticed that there was this one young Japanese guard who was always so nice to us. Every few days, he would be in charge of our little group. And he was always so nice. He let us stop for water. He let us go tear little pages from our Bibles and roll up grass and light it and pretend it was a cigarette to slake our hunger a little bit. And um, we, we just didn't understand this. We weren't allowed to talk to him. But one day, he started whistling very softly. And Cecil said, the younger men in my little group looked at one another and smiled. And he said, I couldn't wait to get back to camp, find out why were you smiling? And they said, that guard was whistling the international jamboree tune from the 1936 jamboree, which took place in the Netherlands. And it was his way of recognizing he had been a Boy Scout. Some of these young Australians must have been Boy Scouts, too. And maybe one day their children would go to jamborees. I wrote that up for Scouting Magazine. They got a 1,000 letters about that story because one of the old editors at the magazine said, oh, well, we have the sheet music for that tune in our file. Yeah. And they, public, they said, anybody who wants the sheet music, right? And they got a thousand letters. <laughs> so it, it, what happened to these people really resonated. And I think what particularly drew me to want to write about first the Burma Railway men, and there were 668 Americans on the Burma Railway, which most people don't know. They think of it as a British Australian, but a uh, Texas battalion was captured on Java. The survivors of the USS Houston, which was sunk off the coast of Java, they all became prisoners and were all sent to the railway. And um, uh, these men were were really living out the 11th commandment without labeling it. Mm -hmm. But their situation was so desperate, they realized early on, if they didn't help one another, they wouldn't, none of them would survive. And so that is how, even though 16,000 of them died on the Burma Railway, mm -hmm. they helped each other, and they helped each other have the will to live. And then, when I was interviewing, uh, uh, Cecil's battalion friends, because his entire Australian battalion was captured on Java, and those were the people I interviewed for my first book. Um, uh, they were saying, after they finished the railway, they were sent to Japan. And I said, what did you do? Well, I was working in a shipyard, I was working in a mine, I was working. I thought, these guys weren't working for the Japanese army. They were working for companies. Uh, I was the first one. You would have to know my son, Philip, to know he designed my website, powslaves42.com. Mm -hmm. And he titled the page, Japan Incorporated's Dirty Little Secret. You yeah. know? <laughs> and that was really what I exposed with unjust enrichment, the fact that these men were working for the companies. The company was paying the Japanese government two, two yen per day per man to use our prisoners, and they were in turn supposed to pay our prisoners Japanese soldiers pay, and that's what they didn't do.
So if anyone likes to calculate what they owe them in back wages plus 60 years interest plus a little workman's comp thrown in, sure. it would be more than the dollar a day they got from our government for missed meals. So. For, the, for, for a little background, the actual uh, slave labor pool that was available for these Japanese companies really emanated from a short period of time uh, where they were captured shortly you know, after well, the war started and, and really were in place for a long, for the entire balance of the war. Right? That's right, because um, the, the earliest um, captive I know of were uh, Terence Kirk who took those right. photographs and uh, some other Marines up in North China. They were guarding a, uh, a, a, a diplomatic outpost and on the night that Pearl Harbor was bombed, before the sunset, they were approached by a Japanese patrol and they had to surrender. And so he was almost four years. He was three years and 10 months, but the rest of them, uh, in, within six months of Pearl Harbor, the entire army of the Pacific was either killed or captured. So we had uh, about 20, more than 20,000 Americans as prisoners of war, and quite frankly, the Japanese never expected that number of the enemy to surrender. They didn't know what to do with them. They, they couldn't adequately feed them and certainly didn't want to. They, you know, were just going to feed them enough to keep them alive enough to work. And if somebody died, no problem. There was more when he came, where he came from. And eventually there were 36,000 Americans in Japanese military prison camps, all of which were on Japanese company property, with very few exceptions. And to the Japanese culture, the fact that they even had 36,000 American POWs it was incomprehensible. That's counterintuitive it's, to their culture, isn't right, it? Right, because they instructed their uh, military people, you do not surrender. You know, that's too dishonorable. You kill yourself before you surrender. The first Japanese they captured was a, a pilot uh, who crashed in uh, the harbor, at Pearl Harbor, and he was unconscious, and they went out and got him before he woke up and could slit his throat. And he was the first captain, immediately became very cooperative, which is the other odd thing about Japanese prisoners of us. He immediately went up in airplanes and spotted emplacements and concealed things for our people. Most of the Japanese who became prisoner, and it was always a kind of an inadvertent thing with them, most of them were in Australia. Mm -hmm. And the Red Cross said the odd thing was that throughout the entire war, not one inquiry was made from the Japanese government about their prisoners, not one package was sent, not one piece of mail. The families were told that in effect, this man was dead. Even though they knew he wasn't dead, he was as good as dead. And I often wondered what happened to those Japanese when they were liberated. What kind of reception did they get back home? Because they were so dishonored and they felt so ashamed. And in an odd way, our government was ashamed that so many of our people were trapped in the Pacific with, in most cases, really lousy leadership except for a few outstanding people like General Wainwright and General King and, and a few others. But a lot of the leadership, a lot of the higher officers in the Pacific had been sent there because they were you know, unsuitable. They were kind of the, the uh, second rank of, of, of competence. And a lot of them drank very heavily, which didn't help. And, so, but there was shame on the part of our government. And I think that shame lasted. They certainly made our prisoners feel ashamed that they had been taken prisoner. And when they came home, many of them did not get anything. There was a troop ship that came into San Francisco, and here were these prisoners of war with other returning veterans. And Here's the band on the dock and the mayor and families. They were kept on board until after dark 
they were not allowed off the ship and they were taken to Letterman Hospital and confined there for quite a while. Uh, but they, they, they weren't allowed, you know, a big welcome homecoming. In some ways, this happened to a lot of people. And uh, the gag order I talked about earlier, where our government, uh, uh, and it was not uniformly applied, only some men on their way home were made to sign this, but they were told no radio interviews, no newspaper interviews, don't write your memoirs, don't show any photographs that you might have uh, without permission from the military, and if you do, you'll spend the rest of your life in Leavenworth. And, you know, this absolutely put the clamp on me. There was one fellow who was in a bar in Detroit, and he was mouthing off about the Japanese. And a couple of FBI men came and tapped him on the shoulder and took him outside and reminded him that he wasn't supposed to be speaking. It's really... When, at the time, because it happened so early on in the war where the American POW pool was created, was there a sense from the United States government that there was maybe a, a direct connect as to how we treated the West Coast Japanese, the internment camp? Was there a connect there? No, not that I know of because we did not remove any Japanese from the West Coast until about at least two months after the Japanese had rounded up every single white man, woman, and child in Asia, including 14,000 Americans, mm -hmm. had thrown them all into internment camps, where most of them slowly, uh, you know, became more and more malnourished. Uh, but I don't think that there was the, the concern with our government was that so many of our people became prisoners of the Japanese and we were aware that the Japanese diet, the government, had not ratified the Geneva Conventions with reference to prisoners of war. So we hurriedly, in late December 1941, through the Spanish Embassy, we sent a message to the Japanese and said, we are going to observe the Geneva Conventions you know, with regard to prisoners of war, because we did have some Japanese as prisoners. And we hope you will do the same. Well, several weeks later, the Japanese replied, well, even though we didn't ratify that part of the Geneva Conventions, we will honor it, mutatis mutandis, which really meant as long as it doesn't interfere with our laws. And as soon as they sent us that message, two weeks later, the Japanese government adopted a whole bunch of regulations about the treatment of prisoners of war and the, you know, that the companies who rented them had to provide medical, food, uh, supposedly Red Cross visits, but they, they ignored that pretty well, and um, the housing they had to provide completely for the prisoners they asked to have sent to their work sites. And um, uh, I think that uh, the, the fact that we kept inquiring, I think there were something like 258 separate messages that we relayed through the, Smith, through the Swiss asking about treatment of prisoners, because we were hearing stories, a few prisoners escaped, and uh, we were hearing stories about how badly they were being treated, and we were trying to inquire what steps the Japanese were taking to look after our prisoners. And I think very much, uh, in recognition that they really weren't able, even if they were willing, they weren't able to properly feed them all or give them medical attention. We got up a secret relief fund with the British and the Dutch, and we set it up through the Swiss bank, which was going to send money to all its branches in Asia that their workers could draw on and literally s deliver supplies mm -hmm. to these prison camps. And the Japanese said, oh, no, 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 no. We will put the money in our bank, and we will do the exchange rate, you know, make a little. And they bottled up the money and didn't release it. And that was 98 million Swiss francs. And we contributed over 6 million, which would be 54 million today. But, the, but what you're asking is, 
Did we connect their treatment of our people with our removal of Japanese? I don't think for another reason that that would have been so, because we did succeed in exchanging mm -hmm. about 3,000 civilians. How did that work, by the way? I know you mentioned it. It was um, a, a, a wonderful book by P. Scott Corbett. It was published by Kent State University Press. I think it's in my bibliography in 1987, called Quiet Passages. And his father was one of the civilians who was successfully brought back here under that program. We had one office in the State Department that worked 24-7 around the clock trying to make arrangements to have secret spots where the grip soul would go with Japanese civilians and we would exchange them. But the Japanese had to be willing to take them mm -hmm. and they had to be willing to go. A, f a fair number of Japanese were willing to go back to Japan but their government didn't want these little farmers and businessmen from Cal. They wanted their diplomats mm -hmm. and their spies and they, you know, they were very selective so it was very difficult to get up a list of people, but that was the idea. We were hoping to exchange um, enough of their civilians to be willing to go to Japan because, you know, the Japanese civilian, the adults, were not American citizens. They weren't allowed to be citizens until 1956. So they were United States residents of Japanese descent. Their children were citizens. And it was their children growing up and becoming politicians and lawyers that demanded the apology and the $20,000 each from our government. But uh, that was how that program was intended to work. We called them relocation centers. The Japanese children growing up and becoming politicians called them concentration camps. But no Japanese I know of died of starvation. In fact, when they had their exhibit, and Ellis Island was one place they set up this mock exhibit of uh, camp, they said, oh, you could tell it was Tuesday because it was meatloaf. I mean, our people would have loved to get meatloaf on a Tuesday, but they, they you know, were uh, relocated mostly because we were totally panicked after Pearl Harbor and Japan controlled the Pacific for six months until June of 42 in the Battle of Midway and that half of that fleet was headed to the West Coast when we intercepted them at Midway. But they, uh, our people were terrified because we did not know who among the Japanese were loyal to our government or who were doing espionage for the Japanese government and there were just enough incidents where the FBI would search a Japanese person's home in California and find the kitchen with two refrigerators, one had food in it, the other had a whole wireless set. And they were uh, so worried about what to do, they, they felt the West Coast was so vulnerable. People I know sat around their radios every night waiting for the Japanese to invade. And, you know, a submarine did shell oil fields in, in California. And so there was so much panic and we had had during the 1930s and early 40s, we had had so much trouble on the East Coast with German spies and German espionage that we were sure that the West Coast uh, would have, and sure enough, people I know in La Jolla uh, could go out at night and see people up in the hills signaling to the Japanese submarines. I mean, it was a very nervous time, and our government didn't know what else to do but just remove Japanese from the West Coast. The ones who lived in Chicago stayed where they were. The ones who lived in the East Coast pretty well stayed where they were, but it was the West Coast. Just as an aside, we had uh, Fred Korematsu. Oh yes, did he here. come? Yeah, he yep. was here. So that was a yeah. He was the leader of the uh, move as as a child growing up and feeling the injustice and feeling the pain of the families because they were baffled. A lot of them. But there were some among them who really felt a great loyalty to Japan and said so. You use a term in the book, unjust enrichment, uh, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this, Zabutsu? Z-A-I? Zaibatsu. I just did. That's all right. Yes, you're allowed. You don't have to speak Japanese. 
Define that for us. The Zaibatsu were like the cartel. They were a, a group of uh, powerful, rich Japanese companies that had interlocking directorates. And there would be people from Mitsui sitting on Mitsubishi's board and whatnot, and they controlled the industries of Japan. And, and, it's, <coughs> and it's that group, which Bob Donahue said, that's the one where there's a not enough documentation right. to indict. Right. And it's that group, which, of course, you uh, uh, indict in your book. Yeah, I expose and exactly. it, you know, do it. And, yeah. and have subsequently led to uh, uh, potential claims, some of which have had some degrees of success. Uh, do you get a sense today, well, let me back up, back during the time of the uh, International Military Tribunal for the Far East, the Tokyo War Crimes Trial, that there was any sense among the, uh, even the American prosecutors that they were guilty, but for the fact there was not enough documents? Or yes. was it strictly political? No, well, Donahai said they regret, he used the word regretfully. We had to notify Mr. Keenan. He and one other investigator were, were really uh, the lead ones looking for enough documentation to indict these CEOs because they knew Mitsui had loaned the Japanese government billions of dollars for the prosecution of the war and of course they were aware um, and they had enough depositions from American uh, POWs that our people had been forced to work and war work for the Japanese and that they had profited from this because they had war quotas that they had to meet. And one, one uh, memorandum I have in my book, they had to make monthly reports to Tokyo, to the Prisoner of War Management Bureau. And this one Mitsui company manager said, oh, our production has never been so good and, and, as it has been since we got these white prisoners. You know, and the, for one thing, by the time our prisoners were in a lot of these company work sites, all of the young Japanese educated um, workers were in the military, and they had the young kids and the old farmers, and a lot of the Japanese were illiterate, and they couldn't read the instruction manuals, but our people could read them. You know? But that was, that was it, Donahai said, that we were so regretted we could not indict them. They didn't meet the level. They, we couldn't find paperwork to rise to the level of being involved in the planning and prosecution of the war, which was the Class A criterion. But he said to me, I always felt that they could have and should have been put on trial for mistreatment of prisoners of war, which occurred on their property. <coughs> how much How much you get a sense of that? that General MacArthur, who was, of course, in charge of the Far East, was somewhat relieved that that case was not documented uh, against the industrialists, knowing that he's got to rebuild right. Japan. There's a very funny meeting that I talk about because the guy wrote such a lengthy report. There was a man named William Sebald, spoke no Japanese, typical of the people on MacArthur's staff, and uh, the Mitsui executives invited him to a power lunch in their boardroom, in the polished table and the crystal and whatnot. And they sat and told, they had him wrapped around their little finger. They told him, well, you know, you've told us that we have to um, step aside and we can't run our companies anymore and we have to dissolve, we have to break up. But we are the ones who know how to rebuild Japan. And if you don't let us, if you don't give us the opportunity to once again do this work and head these companies, we'll have to look elsewhere for help, meaning Russia. Mm -hmm. And this panicked our people so much. And this was Sebald's recommendation to me. He was MacArthur's political advisor. And his recommendation was, we really should let these folks, you know, run their companies again because they know how to rebuild Japan. <laughs>
and I think you're right. I think MacArthur thought it was politically very expedient to just let these people do their thing, and uh, because initially we were quite punitive, and um, uh, we were not willing to give a lot of aid to the Japanese companies. We were sort of letting them stew in their juice for a while. And then we decided, yes, we had to make them our bulwark against communism because the Communist Party had a very big foothold among the workers of Japan. Mm -hmm. And we were so worried the Russians had come into Manchuria, they had come into Korea, and we were afraid that they were going to somehow get control of a lot of the Japanese people, and so that was our goal. It was a Cold War expedient, I think, as much as anything else. I found a little bit of that in uh, the Nuremberg trials when towards 1948-49 there was a lot of pressure on the prosecutors of the subsequent trials to simply uh, move it along because we really do want Germany rebuilt. Mm -hmm. and the Marshall Plan had kicked in and there was a distraction. The, the, the War Crimes Tribunal was a distraction at that point. Uh, how much did that, do you think, played in the Tokyo War Crimes Very Trial? much, yeah. very much, because uh, for one thing, as the Japanese got more confident of their ability to manipulate our people, they got more and more demanding about having these trials over with and releasing the people who had already been convicted. And as I mentioned earlier, Sugamo prison was empty by 1958. Even the people who had been sentenced for life had been let out. And, uh, but the Japanese pushed so to get some of their people and their top diplomatic people out of prison uh, that uh, there were a couple of real top class A war criminals that we had given long sentences to and the Dutch wouldn't sign the 1951 peace treaty until they could be guaranteed that the Japanese would give them a decent compensation for the 23,000 Dutch men, women, and children who died as civilians in these awful Japanese internment camps. So we said, all right, you can make a separate sidebar negotiation, but hurry up. And it gets to be um, um, 1955, and the Dutch still haven't added their signature to the 51 peace treaty. And they're trying to negotiate. They wanted 10 million uh, yen from the Japanese. And the Japanese said, we'll give you 3 million. And we pushed the Dutch to accept that. And the Dutch were saying, well, um, couldn't you detain, you're about to release this big war prisoner, this Japanese, couldn't you wait a week to release him so we'd have a little leverage with the Japanese foreign minister? And we said, no, 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 we've already said we're going, and it's been in the newspapers, so we're going to release him. And we wouldn't even cut that slack for the Dutch. It was all expedience, and you know, the Japanese were, got very good at pushing, you know, and demanding that this all be over and done with. And then, of course, our Tokyo trials went on and on and on, and they were so tedious because there was an American assigned to defend each Japanese and a Japanese, and there was much more of a language problem than there was in Nuremberg. And so these translations went on, and the snail's pace. And these, these uh, Nuremberg trials went off the front page of every newspaper. They went off page 35. They weren't even in the newspapers. And you know, got to be more than two years. And uh, MacArthur would have liked to wrap it up much earlier. But our prosecutors were determined to bring everybody to trial who had been indicted. And that took, you know, that took a while. I think there were 11 countries actually directly involved in that Japanese war crimes trial, and as opposed, of course, to four in Nuremberg. Uh, Hirohito, you talked a little mm -hmm. bit about him. Clearly, uh, he became hands off from a directive in Washington mm -hmm. uh, to the chagrin of every defendant whose neck was in the noose. Right. Uh, and probably to a lot of the prosecutors who would have liked to have certainly get his testimony. Oh, yes. Uh, <coughs> What was, what was your sense of 
Hirohito's involvement with the name of which I can't pronounce, the Japanese industrialist cartel. Mm, the was, Zaibatsu, yes. Uh, <laughs> I just refer to the Z word. The Z word, <laughs> like uh, a dirty word. <laughs> but do you get, was, was Hirohito involved with the, the economics, the, the financial buildup during the war? And did he have an impact as to some of the even post-war rebuilding process that, that if, did you get a sense of that? Um, not as directly as of the companies like Mitsubishi loaning billions and other companies, you know, giving the Japanese government money. I don't know how much the imperial household contributed to the war effort because there were, you know, there were lots of riches there and there's still an awful lot down in their vault. Um, but I, John Dower may have written more specifically about that and then some of the other Pacific War historians like Ed Dre uh, may have uh, commented more, concentrated more, or learned more. All I know was that uh, Hirohito was so involved in the planning of the war how much he contributed toward buying material, I don't know, but uh, he certainly was very involved in the planning. The trouble was he met separately with his army and navy uh, commanders. They never met all together, so he never got a whole picture from anyone. And that was quite a drawback because they were all telling him what he wanted to hear a lot of the time. So, and I really don't know that much about it. But was he a decision maker, or was he a kind of inf influence in the sense that he was the imperial family? He called them to give him their best thinking, and then allegedly, you know, the agreement uh, or the plan would come from him. Um, as to, you know, whose advice to follow. The only time I know of for sure when he made the decision was when the inevitable was happening and they knew that they had to, that they had lost the war. And um, a group of members of Hirohito's inner circle and his cabinet understood that and wanted to lay down their own, wanted to surrender. They didn't want any more killings, any more bombings, and they knew we were on our way to invade their sacred ground, and uh, so they wanted to pack it in. There was such a strong group of militants, an equal number, who did not want, they wanted to fight to the last man, woman, and child, and some of the villagers told the POWs when they were liberated, we were more angry by the end of the war at our own army than we were at the Americans. We would not have picked up bamboo spears and fought. We would not have done that. So that was, but the, the, the contention and the arguing went on and on and on. We dropped the first atom bomb, we waited, we thought for sure they'd surrender then. We waited three days, dropped the second atom bomb, and then there was six more days. And meanwhile, they were arguing, and finally, they said, the emperor will have to make this decision. We cannot agree. So the emperor goes to the radio station, and he makes two recordings. You remember those old plastic 78 RPMs? He made two copies of the recording that was going to be played at 7 o'clock the next morning on the radio, announcing that we must bear the unbearable and this is it, it's all done, cooperate with the Americans. And uh, the militants got wind of it. And they, uh, he suspected, and his uh, uh, Chamberlain Quito uh, Kido certainly suspected that these people would hear about this recording and break into the palace and try to find it. And so he hid the records under the Empress's bed pillow because he knew that was the one place that these zealots would not dare to enter would be the Emperor's bed Empress's bedchamber. So sure enough, they broke in, they killed some palace guards, they ransacked the palace, they looked all over, 
for these recordings and couldn't find them. And that is how he got to make the announcement. And that was the one time I know that he made the decision. That's an interesting story. It is, I've isn't it? It's that. one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple of individuals who were from Germany and they reflected on the, Nur the trial at Nuremberg uh, as a cathartic event for the German people in the sense that uh, from that trial there was uh, an airing of all of the evils of the Nazi government from that at least the people had a chance to they, the, to learn about it to, to learn know. about it and ultimately they see a direct line to democracy that they see today in Germany it's and, mm. and by the way they they think Jackson is the architecture of Nuremberg and we're not disabusing him so yeah, yeah, it's that, a wonderful that's good. connect that's, Jackson yeah. Nuremberg catharsis democracy uh, does that same hold sway in Japan? Not at all. And one of the key reasons was that when Washington ordered, and MacArthur agreed with that, MacArthur also did not want to put the emperor on the witness stand or implicate him in the trials, make him the central figure of responsibility for everything that happened. Because after all, every command, everything was done in the emperor's name, and that is why this execution order that I got hold of uh, was introduced, as it turned out, in the trial with no comment, because anybody who would cross-examine the British soldier who found that slightly burned copy in his old camp in Taiwan... Uh, By the way, I'm going to stop you. Why you explain to yes, the audience what that... That was order. really... Uh, there was a policy that was established very early on by the Japanese military that any commandant of any POW camp, including civilian internment camps, if he thought he was going to have to surrender to the enemy, he was to kill all the prisoners first, or all the civilians first. And I guess the idea was very simple, no witnesses, no war crimes trials. But <clears throat> he, the order was so established that in um, October of 1943, uh, our Navy began shelling Wake Island again, which, also, which after all had been our territory. And the Japanese admiral in charge of the prisoners on Wake Island thought that we were going to take it. So he, oh, it was so cruel, he marched these 98 American POWs down to the lagoon and said, you are going to go home. And they thought a submarine was going to come and pick them up. And then suddenly, click, click, everybody was kneeling with their back to, to the land, and they were all shot. And um, a year later, in December of 1944, again, the commander of little Palawan Island, which was sitting in the Pacific on the way to the Philippines, he thought for sure that General MacArthur was going to take Palawan Island on his way to the Philippines. So he uh, arranged to have a phony air raid, and he uh, had his uh, guards herd 157 Marines into the tunnel, and they lit both ends of the tunnel and they burned it, 11 of them escaped. And uh, uh, they were beginning to wonder, all the commanders were beginning to wonder, uh, how can we act on our own without waiting for orders from Tokyo? When do we start executing the prisoners? And there was a message that went at the end of July 1944, and on August 1st, 1944, the British intercepted this reply from Tokyo, which is the little document that this British prisoner found in his camp. And the reply was, uh, you may take matters into your own hands if you feel you are about to surrender, if you feel there is going to be a rebellion, uh, you will start the process, whether you do it by smoke or by poisoning or by bullets, or by burning, however you do it, just make sure you annihilate them all and you are not to leave any traces. That was the most chilling thing, and that was August of 1944. And our military knew that, MacArthur knew that, Truman knew that, 
They knew that the Japanese were going to execute our prisoners when we invaded wherever our prisoners were being held. On the Burma Railway in Thailand, um, the order was to start executing them on the 20th of August, 1945, because that was the day the Japanese believed the British were going to land in Burma. And that would be the end. In Thailand, in Japan, on Taiwan, all during the summer of 1945, these prisoners saw the machine guns on tripods being turned inward toward the camp. In Thailand, they were ordered to take off all their rings, their dog tags, anything metal that might survive burning. You didn't have to be a genius to know what was in store, that they were planning to kill them. It was only a matter of whatever day. And as a matter of fact, uh, a group of officers were going to break out of a camp in Thailand, group of Australians, on August 14th, 1945. They were going to break out that night, and then the emperor's broadcast made that not necessary. But it was so close. We knew that we had to end the war in early August 1945. We knew we had to do that, or else nearly 200,000 people were going to be annihilated. And uh, the the uh, uh, sense of, of justice was very curtailed because we did, not, we did not complete punishment for Japanese. And by not putting the emperor on the stand, that made the Japanese feel if the emperor isn't being asked to apologize on behalf of his nation for all the chaos and killing and torture and, and everything that they caused, if he's not going to have to apologize, then we don't have to apologize. And it's a totally different mindset in Japan. Plus the fact that a lot of Japanese felt, and that's the basis for the Yakusuni Shrine is these people fought for their com country. They fought nobly. Uh, we don't have to apologize for what they did. They, they were serving their emperor. End of story. And it's just a completely different feeling. And it really goes back to the fact that we really did not make the emperor uh, even utter a statement of apology. And the Japanese diet still won't do an official statement. A couple of prime ministers have made their own personal apologies when the Chinese and the Koreans got really angry at them and wanted to break off diplomatic relations. Then they issued personal apologies to their Asian neighbors, but never to the Americans. You agree with Truman's decision to draft the atomic bomb based on your research? Um, yes, because they knew that it was going to take our ultimate weapon to make the Japanese surrender. Even the militants would see that the destruction was so terrible uh, that, you know, they would have to stop. And also, Truman was aware of this order, this directive. I call it an execution order, but I've been corrected by a, uh, an historian who, who documented a lot about the, the uh, Tokyo trials and has written the definitive volumes. On, and he says it was not a military order. It doesn't have a military order number on it, but it was a clarification of the original directive. That's what that piece of paper was. But um, yeah, I think they felt they had this and they had to do something really dramatic because the Japanese um, military people who were in charge of their government were not going to um, make any negotiation. Although the Japanese were working with the Russians trying to help negotiate a surrender. So there was some, you know, diplomatic movement, but among the militants, the militarists who really ran the government, uh, they were really not, not willing. And, and I think we knew the clock was ticking, and we knew this August 20th date in Burma and Thailand, and that would affect all the civilians in Sumatra and Java and whatnot, and then sequentially up, you know, in the 
in China and Taiwan and the home islands. It was just, we had to make that war end. People are going to pick up this book on just enrichment, I'm sure, after today uh, and read it. And what do you hope that they walk away with after having read this? I hope that people would recognize more what our men went through and that they have not received justice uh, of any sort. Uh, these men, so many of them say, I don't really want money from the Japanese companies, but I would like them to apologize for the way they treated us. That's part of it, but also I think now that when my book came out in 2001, the court cases were still alive in California. And subsequently, the state and Justice Department lawyers insisted to the judges who were willing to hear these cases, which were being brought against specific Japanese companies by people who had worked for that company. Um, and they insisted, this will interfere with our foreign relations and our ally Japan, and we will embarrass the Japanese, and you can't hear these cases. And it's, it's a moot question, it's an open question whether the company heads were included in the peace treaty that said we wouldn't sue any more Japanese uh, entities. But the company people were never included in that planning and prosecution of the war. So there is a question whether they can, particularly where we know they were ordered to pay the men and still owe them that money. So there was a, a frustration that uh, when, when my book was being published, there was hope that there might be some compensation, some gesture uh, that would help uh, bring a, a sense of justice to these men. And I think what, what has happened subsequently, particularly where the White House requested that the bills that were passed in Congress for our own government to finally make a gesture of about $20,000 to each surviving POW. We we're all only talking about 700 people mm -hmm. that, you know, so many of them have died. Um, that, that it was the White House, this current White House, that requested that that amendment be deleted from the defense bill so that still it's our own government that is not allowing these men to have some gesture of recognition that they should be compensated for what they went through. That's perhaps what I hope most, is that people will have a better understanding. If anyone can find a way to make some Japanese feel uh, obligated to do something, that would be very nice. Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Kawasaki, when you see a jet ski on Lake Chautauqua, <laughs> think about that. There were, they had 200 of our prisoners and 100 of them died on Kawasaki property. Um, it's the um, making any Japanese company and head feel that it would be the right thing to do for them to make some gesture. That would be nice. Making our State Department feel that they should at least bring up the subject. That would be, that would be very nice. Well, it's just absolutely groundbreaking information you provided to, to the world. Uh, information which certainly had not been known to many. As we conclude, could you explain what you have around your neck? Oh yes, this is the uh, symbol of the American Defenders of Baton and Corregidor. And they gave me a little gold-plated one <laughs> from, as a gesture of, of recognition of all that I have tried to do and am still trying to do uh, to help them feel that we appreciate what they did, and we appreciate their suffering, uh, because I don't think many of them feel that way. Well, so that's it. Well, we appreciate Thank everything you. you've done in coming Thank here you. today. Oh, Thank that you. was my pleasure. Thank you it's so, so much. Nice. Thank you for the gift. So yeah. <laughs>
have some, some time constraints, including Linda's, but uh, what I'll do, if anybody has any specific questions, we're going to go off camera now, but uh, feel free. But Linda, we can't thank you enough. Oh, it's my pleasure, really, to be back in Chautauqua County and to be able to go through Buffalo again. It's just very nice, but I am so impressed with what you've done in just five years. Roly says, five years you've created all of this? It's really wonderful. It's, it's such a tribute to wanting to, to preserve history. That's the